He lowered her eyes and said, of course. So then I summoned up the courage to ask, and us too? Shoot us? I don't know, she said. But the fact that father was to be shot was clear from the start. Rikov seemed doomed. But his wife thought he should make one final appeal. She saw hope in a letter another purge victim had written to Stalin. When my mother had read the letter, she turned to him and said, we should have done just the same. We should have denied all the accusations against us too. And then he did the strangest thing. He turned to her, his face had changed. It was gray, unrecognizable. There was rebuke in his eyes. And he said, surely you've understood by now that it's all useless, it's hopeless, pointless. The whole thing would be useless. No one felt safe from the purges. Even government ministers like Foreign Commissar Maxim Litvinov waited for the midnight knock on the door. He never went to bed without a revolver under his pillow. And there was an arrangement between him and my mother that if they came to the door, she'd give a special knock on his door and he'd shoot himself because he didn't want the humiliation and all that. We used to play bridge into the small hours. Somewhere after two or three, we decided they're not coming tonight. Because he hated the idea of being found in his pajamas and raked out of bed. <laughs> Litvinov survived. But in the 1930s, virtually every member of Lenin's first revolutionary government was picked off by Stalin. People were being arrested right and left. There, people were being swept away in the frenzy, in the hunt for enemies of the people. I myself, being a foreigner then, it was dangerous. Like every other Russian, I too had to sleep with my clothes on because any night they would come for you. It was terrible. People wouldn't laugh on the street. Everybody was sulky. People were walking like ghosts because of the fear. They didn't know what tomorrow would bring. They couldn't bank on tomorrow because maybe they wouldn't be alive or be there. The citizens of Leningrad were a particular target. Stalin purged them ruthlessly in case another Kirov arose to threaten his power base in Moscow. In the summer of 1937, the beautiful northern capital played host to a record number of tourists. In secret, the terror was reaching its height. I came to Leningrad in the summer of 1937. It was a particularly beautiful summer. Along with the other tourists, I came here to the Peter Paul Fortress to see the old Tsarist prison cells. It's still a great tourist attraction, but as we walked around here in 1937, we thought this was a relic of the dead past. Little did we realize that there were five modern prisons in Leningrad, crammed with 30,000 enemies of the state who would have been grateful for this comparative luxury. In the Cresty prison, 16 people shared a cell built to house just one person. They were often sent to jail after first being denounced by workmates. <laughs> 
She says, bandits are plotting to take away from the world's workers our most dear and beloved Stalin. She demands no mercy must be shown to the enemy. They should be shot. During the meeting, we were forced to vote for the death of this man who was standing with two guards. And uh, I voted, like everybody else. Everybody put up their hand. So I voted for him. I don't know who he is, I don't know what he did, but I voted because that was the situation. If you didn't put up your hand, you, you would be arrested. A word out of place could bring death or imprisonment. In the Kremlin, Augusta Karlovich had to be especially careful. People were afraid of prison, afraid to speak. And so when they were arrested, they informed on each other. I remember once, a group of us used to get together, sit round and play cards, where someone told a joke about the government. It turned out there was an informer there, a Stalinist. Well, he informed on him. And the man, the engineer, he got 10 years hard labor on the Volga Canal. Youth organizations like the Young Pioneers encourage children to inform on their parents. A 14-year-old from the Urals was held up as a model. Pavlik Morozov had denounced his father for doing business with enemies of the people. Father was shot. Pavlik was murdered by members of his family. But Pavlik's heroic deeds inspired witnesses like this young boy, Nikitin. Even today, the pioneers still honor Pavlik Morozov. The state penetrated the heart of family life. This was a world where children were trained to thank Stalin for their happy childhood. The new moral code demanded that everyone put loyalty to party and state first. As a result, everyone lived in fear. People soon learned the drill. After denunciation came arrest. One night, Tatiana Gomolitskaya saw her mother taken away. At two o'clock in the morning, there was a ring of the bell that I thought, oh, another search, all right. And uh, it took a very long time. I think about, at about uh, 7.30 they finished. And then he said, well, get ready to go to my mother. And then I, I asked him, what can she take with her? And I gathered all the things that she may need. And he left with her. And I just fell down on my knees and started crying and said, oh God, why don't I believe in you? Because it was the only being who could help me. Nobody could help me. In every city, the same routine was followed. Arrested prisoners were interrogated. At Kiev in the Ukraine, they were taken to the October Palace. Then, as now, it was outwardly a place of culture. Beneath the stage lay the secret police headquarters and the cells. When I went into the 
When I entered the basement, I couldn't believe my eyes. Everywhere along the walls were small, narrow cupboards, and they'd been specially constructed so you couldn't sit in them or stand properly. You had to sort of crouch. Those little cupboards had been specially thought out to torment people, so that after a certain time in them, when we were taken to the interrogator, we would already be completely broken. In a cell deep in the building, methods had been devised to persuade Vikenty Grochowski to admit to all charges. In the room there were four tables. There were people lying on the tables. Well, I don't even know if you'd call them people. They were completely covered in blood. They were being beaten with sticks. Their flesh was raw, blood was dripping onto the floor. This was the torture room. The guard said to me, had a look. Well, if you don't want to end up here, you'll have to sign. Trucks took bodies from the October Palace. On their way back, they stopped at the waterside. We parked the truck next to the lake, this one here, the tailbin. We opened up the back and pulled out the tarpaulin. I had a look in the back of the truck and saw that it was covered in blood, thick, half-dried blood. I was shocked. I looked at Misha. What's up, he said. I told you I'd drive enemies of the people. And he added, but not live ones, dead ones and I'm not the only one who does it. Lots of us do. These woods near Kiev are one huge graveyard, for the purges were especially savage here. In the midst of the terror, a new constitution was proclaimed. It promised all the nationalities of the Soviet Union new liberties. It guaranteed freedom of speech. It recognized the right to demonstrate. It promised every Soviet citizen protection from arbitrary arrest. A coal mine at Vorkuta in the Arctic Circle. These miners earn three times as much as the average Soviet worker. But in the 1930s, this was a slave labor camp for enemies of the people. Today's miners travel to the coal face by train. Then, it was a two-hour trek on foot. There were no machines for cutting coal. The prisoners used a pick or a piece of wood. Many had nothing but their own bare hands. The Vokuta mines were part of the Gulag, a network of forced labor camps built in the harshest places in Stalin's empire. At Vorkuta, temperatures of minus 50 centigrade are common. In the 1930s, the only access was by river from Archangel, 1,500 miles away. 
Where the modern town now stands, the prisoners lived in wooden barracks. Ilya Ilin was one of them.